Awesome, awesome. How's everybody doing today? Yeah, all right. Got the half. The cool thing is it wasn't just like one side. It was a little bit in here and a little bit in there. Tell, turn your narrow elbow up in the ribs and say, wake up. Wake up, wake up. Can't have none of that hot oh, stuff going on in here today. Even if you were up way past your uh, and everybody else in your neighborhood's bedtime. But anyway, we got some good things in store for you guys today. We're excited about it being Sunday, as always. Excited about when we believe that uh, God's, you know, when He organizes. I believe that, I, I happen to believe, and I'll just ask if you agree with me. I, I believe that God organized Sundays. And Mondays and Tuesdays, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturdays. I believe he has organized everything that we come in contact with on every single day. And so I just believe that today, sun, on a Sunday, happens to just be an overflow. It's not what people plan and put together. It's what God has put in people's hearts to share. And what people, God has put in people's hearts to see. What God has put in people's hearts to speak with you about even before or after service and in the teaching or wherever the flow is. I believe that it is a time that God has set aside to speak directly to direct situations that he wants to deliver and help us to live out his abundant life in. But with all that, I want to share with you guys a, something really, really good. Number one, I need to ask. We're kind of touring around. There's people out of town today and things. Some of the younger crowd that they may would be more into it. Nothing against if you're a little more mature, but just I'm just considering. But would we happen to have a couple of teams of volleyball today? If we set up the nets and everything that would, that would be in, or else you could like bring all your posse and everything. Because I don't want to be sitting out there, setting up net, and sitting underneath it crying and waiting on you. And like one of you shows up, and the rest of you says, oh, well, I was talking to my mom, and I couldn't come. I, I, want, I want to know. I need to show of hands. I got, I got a few. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, we got it. All right. That's cool. And if, you, and if you're coming, bring somebody with you. And if there's somebody sitting close to you, they don't count. So you got to find somebody else. But anyway, invite people. The coolest story. A few years ago, well, actually about a couple years ago, we were doing a, just a picnic thing. We're going to do one of those real soon. And it was on a Sunday where we were playing games every Sunday evening during the summertime. Sometime we usually pick it up. And one day I said, my house, I'm like, you know what? I ain't putting up with this. I got all these people in my phone that I never see or I hadn't seen in a long time. And I sent a text to everybody. Everybody. Hey, come hang out today. I didn't tell them the church thing. I said, come hang out today. We're going to play volleyball and cook, yada, yada, burgers, have fun. And uh, like two families I hadn't seen forever showed up. And uh, I won't say which one of y'all it is, but one of y'all families is still here right now. But uh, so, hey, I'll leave it at that. But anyway, so, hey, maybe go through your, 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 your book, your contacts, and hit them up. But uh, praise God. I do have an announcement. Actually, I don't. So that's going to be what, 5 o'clock? 5 o'clock. All right. Want to come early and help set up a net? You can do that. Nobody will fight you over it. Miss Tanya. I'd love for you to come and like shout. In the light, you gotta come in the light, in the light, in the light. This lady's been in the spotlight for too long to hide in the dark. Go for it. Misty sabotaged you. Good morning, I don't know how to work it. <laughs> Good morning everybody. I'm gonna do my best to get through this without bawling because I'm so excited and so overwhelmed that yesterday we had the, the co-ed ball tournament that I've been keep talking about to everybody. And all of y'all have been so generous and so supportive. Amen. That in itself was overwhelming for me. It brings me to tears daily. And Amen. <laughs> um, yesterday, we had a very hard week trying to decide if we were even gonna be able to do this. And as everybody knows, it's, you know, it, it's not a quick, easy thing just to pull together with a lot of people involved. So we spent all week just praying diligently, asking for everyone's prayers that clearly were answered that we'd be able to do this. We were thrown a, you know, a couple things that we had to change, and that was okay. Um, we rose up to that, and we changed locations. We changed the tournament a little bit. Everybody was still on board, and you know, we didn't even lose that many people, which was in awe of that because we ended up. We started out with 12 teams, and we still ended up with 11 with last-minute changes, and that in itself is amazing. And we had the most wonderful day. And if you were there, thank you, thank you, thank you. Even if you weren't, thank you, thank you, thank you, because I know Amen. your prayers, the hard work, the people that stayed behind, 
and you know help clean up the people that I mean people coming out of the woodwork I can't even I can't even explain it my words I just yeah. don't feel like are enough to explain this day and it was amazing to watch the radar over and over again all day long at the threat of rain all around us and basically it was like I felt like I had a vision of God all day long every time I would look around I felt like I could I could physically see him standing with his arms around this ballpark that's how it felt his presence was so clear and so obvious that people would come from just the high school and say yeah it's pouring over there it's coming we would never see it we would get little sporadic showers here and there that meant absolutely nothing to us so it, it was an amazing day it was a successful day beyond measure we ended up with the tournament pulling in three thousand two dollars and fifty cents yeah last year was twenty five hundred so we definitely we we took it up a notch then we had sponsors caitlin got out and really hustled and drummed up sponsors for yeah. the tournament that brought in another thousand fifty dollars so our grand total for this tournament hashtag round two was four thousand fifty two dollars and fifty cents amazing amazing and i was sharing this morning that you know every time we do something every time we do one of these it, whether it's for Danny Cowley or for other reasons, I, I, at the end I think, whew, we could never beat that. You know, that, there's no way we could ever beat that. This is awesome. And yeah. then God's like laughing, yeah, watch me. And he does. Yeah. I mean, he shows up and he shows out. Yeah. And uh, the everybody, thank you. You know, God used each and every one of you. There was no small part. Because when I tell people over and over again, when they're in awe of pulling this thing together and they're coming to me, you know, like I'm doing something grand, no, it takes everybody. It takes a village to do this. And everybody stepped up. Amen. Everybody participated. There's no small role in this. And I just thank you from the bottom of my heart that this was what it was. It pulled us together. It connected people. It was, it was beyond just a tournament to raise money. And it will it will be in my heart forever. Thank you. You know, when as a believer, everything that we do as a ministry, and I'd say thank you. You guys have ministered to my family greatly. But y'all been doing that for a long time. Y'all have. It's things like this is the heart like Tanya was speaking but I feel from you guys all the time and not just in an adoption kind of way but just in a a brother a, a, a fellow believer a part of the body kind of way it goes way beyond a a phase of life the way y'all embrace the entire life that's why I, I love, honestly, I, I, I get excited easily. I never cringe. Some people that, I've heard people come to me literally and say, so-and-so has been telling me to go to your church. And they go to a church. Not like the people they invited to come here. The people that invited them to come here, you know, the people that initiated the invitation, didn't invite them to their church. They invited them over here. I think they should invite them to theirs. Don't get me wrong. I, we're not in the competition thing. But it's that heart that you shine. It's that heart that you share. It's that that we continually talk about being a life-giving people that is leading people to be fully devoted followers of Christ. That mental, that heart is captivating. Yesterday, you never know the stories that are going on. And I know there's a whole lot that's going on in the background that I don't know. And that, but I, I, I know bits and pieces, but not like data sheets of everybody and what everybody's done. But I know everybody's done a lot. And yesterday, toward the end of the day, there's this one guy that I only see like once a year, literally. And I uh, ran into him just very, very briefly uh, when I was coaching one of my kids' ball team. And it was just high and by, but for some reason, there's always seemed to be a connection I never could figure out because there never was much conversation. And his sister comes up at the end of the day, and uh, she says, I came out here to see my brother. 
I said, yeah. She said, yeah, we're all so busy. She said, he hasn't been home in three months. I said, oh, okay. All right, you know, think about that. And uh, I said, yeah, since he lives in Scarfield, he, he only came down for this because he wanted to help y'all. And this guy's connected to me, like, by a thread. I mean, there's, but he's a part of the body of Christ. The love runs deep in the body of Christ. I know people in here, but I saw their mom chasing around a ballpark that their brother was telling me, saying, she just came down here for this. That kind of stuff where you move your life out of the way for us, that's the kind of thing I want to share with the whole world of how Christ has influenced and moved in your life in such a way that it's not just for me. I know that. It's not just for my wife. It's not just for my children that you chase around and help do things with. But I see it. I know you well enough that I know these are things that happen throughout the week with other people. And so as a pastor, I get to be around a lot of complaining people. And I even get to every now and then be around somebody who complains about the church they're in, the, the, maybe the people that they're a pastor of. I want to say thank you that you just embrace some things that are a little raw and some things that are a little easy. I want to say thank you that you embrace the life of Christ saying even where it challenges me I'll go Lord because I'm being conformed to your image. I'm moving out of me and I'm becoming like you. And I say thank you but I also say you know what there's a whole community that I want to see embrace that. Are you with me? Amen. And we can do this. It can happen. It happens through the day-to-day -day connections. It happens through the outreaches. It happens through the services. There's no excuse really for it not to. And when you plant something, you plant it to grow, to bloom, to bear fruit. When God does that with people, He plants you. He plants us. He plants a church in a place to blossom, to grow. He plants the people, whether it's in your job or in your family or in your neighborhood, to blossom and to grow. And that is to bear more believers coming to Him. Nothing else matters at the end of the day. Thank you for your love for my family. I'm going to be honest. Thank you that you just loved me in the same way that I believe you love everybody else. And I believe everybody else can be moved by the same compassion of Christ working through you. Thank you. Wow. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for today, God. God, I thank you that you have ordained this day. I thank you for abundant provisions for me personally, yes. I thank you, God, that it's more about connecting, I believe even more than connecting with our family, I believe it's about restoring the orphans in the homes, God. I believe that to be the heartbeat of why people are giving and doing and have gave themselves so radically. But God, even far more than that, there are so many people that are even in families today in this community that do not realize they are orphaned from you at this moment. And God, I pray that you will use us as a church that helps people that are fatherless discover you as their father. I pray it happens in here today. But I pray this be a week of testimonies of it happening all week long, God. Have your way completely. Conform us into your image. Giving your life freely wherever we go, Father. Have your way in Jesus' name. Everybody said.
being refreshed in his presence. Father God, we put no time limit on our worship, God. situation under control. We thank you, Father, that all of your promises are true. God. Lean on you today, Lord. We want to be like you, Father. We want to know your heart, God. There's a temptation to run from it. There's a temptation to be afraid because we look at ourselves and we see that we think we're so far away. We think, how could God love me? The places that I've been and the things that I've done. But the very act of Him inviting us into His presence is a declaration of His love for us. The very act of His invitation to come on in, it's... It's a demonstration of his love. He says, come just as you are. Let me wrap my arms around you today. Amen, amen. Can you put your hands together to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. I don't know about you. At least it sounds like about four of you joined in on all of that. That uh, I've been with Jesus this morning, y'all. How about you? I'm serious. My goodness. It, when you're with Jesus, it gives you confidence. It reminds you again that, you know what, it never was about you to begin with. It was about Him from the very start, and nothing has changed about that. It gives me great confidence in His plan and His desires and His mission for today. So praise God, praise God. Tell you what, again, I want to say thank you so much to everyone for giving so sacrificially. But greater than that, get that out of the way, greater than that, I'm glad you love my family. I'm glad I can say we've really feel it, but greater than that, and I said this a while ago, but I mean it, everything is an absolute miracle as far as provisions, but thank you, thank you, thank you that you care for the orphans in such a way. I don't think you'd do this for us to go to Disney. <laughs> if you gave us that to go to Disney, we'd probably squander it somewhere else on a long camping trip. But uh, seriously, thank you for giving so graciously from your heart, your money, your time. And here's the cool part about it. 
You gave of all this not because of who you see now, but you gave because of who you can see coming into a home. I believe that. I believe that. You gave not because of who you can see, but because, but yet because of who you can see, if you follow me. That's what a church does, though, isn't it? A, a church keeps a broken, yet a faithful heart for those that we can't actually, actually physically see, but yet we see you anyway. It's oftentimes much more real than the very person sitting next to us. Thank you for being the kind of life-giving church because when the day comes that we only act and we only give and we only live by what we see right now and not what we see ahead, that is the day that individually we die. That is the day that the church dies. And I'm not talking about the cornerstone. I'm talking about the church as a whole. Think about it. If Jesus would have have ever made his choice of action, if he had ever made his choice of reaction to the current moments, he would have forgotten that his father gave him an eternal purpose and he would have just wiped everybody out. The scripture declares, says, not that, you know, sometimes when we don't like things in scripture, we say, well, I think what he really meant was. Y'all don't say that, do you? If you do that, don't ever say it, please, please. You know, well, I know it says this, but uh, I think what it meant was saying if that was possible, stay away from those conversations. He didn't say, if, 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 if it was possible, he would have said that. Jesus is not low on vocabulary. Think about it. If Jesus, if the Bible says that he could have called down legions of angels, ended it all, said, you know what? I'm done with this. Going home, tired of it, not putting up with it anymore. He could have. Not if it were possible, but he really could have. The Bible declares it. The scriptures tell, tell us he had this authority to destroy the world and forfeit the cross. However, the author of Hebrews 12, 2 reminds us of this. It says, because of the joy set before him, he endured the cross, even though he was despising the shame. But before the, check this out. He's got joy in the middle of what he's enduring, even though he despises what's happening at the moment. This is, a, this is the level of Jesus. He was despising the moment, yet he endured the full surrender to his father, not because of what, what he, that he, oh, well, I just know I'll make it through it. I know I'll come through. Y'all ever do that? You know, well, you know, it ain't where it should be, but, but you know, we we'll always make it through. Not because he would just make it through, but because, or because, well, you know, I'll, I'll get over this and I'll recover but because it would end. Do we ever try to appease our emotions? Do we ever try, let me ask you, do we ever try to, to psych ourselves up to remain faithful, to hold on? Do, do we ever try to just endure basically, basically just because we believe, you know, it'll be over eventually? You know, we'll make it through. I just want to ask you, is that mindset working out real good so far? For me, it does not. If you've got a better way of it, then hey, praise God. But for me, that doesn't. But the author of Hebrews didn't say that he endured because he realized it would only be a little while. He endured because of the joy that was before him. And not the end, not the end that he saw coming, but the joy that he saw coming. The joy of the people that were slaves in their sin. The joy of the people that they only had a hope of surviving through the moment and nothing more. That he endured the day-to-day, -day, yet only... They only hoped it would be over. And today, if you are just hoping to survive, hoping to make it to the end of what you are going through, I want to tell you, there is a God who wants, who wants so bad to plant in your heart and mind of what it means to live with the joy that he sets before you. It's a joy that is bigger than us, and it involves... Even this is so much larger. It is a joy that is so radically overwhelming, a joy that comes from the Father that can be so even tangibly seen that it's not only for us to enjoy, but that others can see His joy op operating through at such a level that they are too attracted to Christ. Yesterday I had a man on numerous occasions. He told me, I just thought I'd go to church. I remember when his kids were younger, they'd ask him. He wasn't having nothing to do with it. Still didn't have anything to do with it. And he told me, he said, 
these are the only kind of thing. He loves playing ball, loves playing sport. He said, these are the only kind I play. Uh, these, these, with, with the kind of people that are out here, the benefit that is out here. He said, you don't have all the yang yang and all the fussing and all the carrying on. Everybody's just in it. And what, he, what, what he's seeing is a, everybody is good nature. What, if he keeps getting close to it, what he'll see is, you know what, there's a lot of people out there in the midst of a lot of pain, yet they have joy anyway because it's not what they can see or what they are going through, but because of what they can see of what God has set up and how he's a deliverer. You know, that's what a life-giving church does. That's what a life-giving people that are leading others to be fully devoted followers of Christ do. Not just displaying how to make it, but for the joy that he says before us. Thank you. I say thank you again for being the life givers to my family. But thank you for being life givers to people that have never met Christ. People that possibly you have never even met. But I trust that you see them anyway. Thank you for giving the life of Jesus in ways that in this community every week. As we make choices not for what we see now, but for what we can see ahead. Are y'all like that? Do y'all, are y'all looking down the road? My, my house, it can get real tense if we're not looking at, well, you know what? We can take a long weekend. It doesn't matter if it's six months out, preferably sooner. It doesn't matter if it's eight months out, preferably sooner. But when just everything is going, especially if friction builds and tension builds and, and life is crumbling around, I mean, because life happens to everybody that I've ever seen born alive. But if you kind of have something set out, in the, even in the physical, there is a relief. But you know what? Once it's over, it's over. But with the, when we can look, go a step beyond that as believers in Christ to step into the spiritual realm and to say, you know what? It's not only for the now. It's not only for the little getaway. It's not for the long weekend. But it's even for the joy that Christ set before me that he has made attainable even for me to walk in today regardless of what's going on. He has made me able to walk in tomorrow regardless of what's going on. And you know what? I can endure this whole life and live and with shame the whole life of what this world has given, maybe of what I've even put myself into. But yet because of the joy of what my eternity is going to be with like him you know what it makes it where it really is in true indeed a fact where the weeping may last during the night but there is a joy that we can see as Paul described coming in the morning you know what I life he did he, he never said weeping may last for the night and joy may come in the morning and weeping may come the next night he didn't say that he put an end to one part and an unending to the second that's cool I like that about Jesus. It's a pretty good thing. Today as we continue New Life, chapter 1. Chapter 1. We're just kind of looking at, working through some things. What did Jesus change when he, brought, when he came to earth? Because there was a lot of things that God had set in order. God had a system. God had a plan of Jesus coming from the foundation of the world. But until he actually came here, there was a system that ran. There was a way that ran. There was a tradition that ran on. But when Jesus came, there was so much that he changed. We looked at this last week with the prodigal son, of how the, the second son just couldn't understand, why is my brother forgiven? Because Jesus brought a grace that this world had never seen. He brought a kindness of forgiveness that nobody had ever experienced before. So as we go into this series, we're looking at a brand, the brand new changes that Jesus brought when he came. You know, the good thing about Jesus, he didn't just preach. Jesus, Jesus didn't just do miracles and go to the cross and the tomb. And then rise again. That's part of just like, well, here's my order. One, two, three, boom. That's my process. I've made it. I've done my job and gone. The great turmoil, the very reason that he was crucified, the very reason that he was rejected, the very reason that he was despised by so many is, yes, that was the plan for salvation to be available to you and I. But the means that God brought the plan about was Jesus came. And Jesus to completely change the religious system as they knew it. And everything the people had built their lives on, they had built their hope on, they had built their security on. And everything that had been passed down. And that they were even in the process of passing on to their children as it went on. Everything that the people found comfort in at that level in, in society and in, in the earthly time zone. He changed everything that they had assumed they knew everything about. Do you ever do that? Do you ever 
enter a certain, maybe a certain season of your life, maybe prepare for a certain event in your life, maybe, and then everything gets changed. You, you have kind of a way that you think it's going to work out, and then it does, it completely changes midstream. You know, maybe you, you prepare for college. I did this. I was told I was going to college. So I said, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. Went there, I remember going like in the, in the, in the mid-summer or whatever, the kind of, you know, that days where you're freshmen and you're suckers, so you go to all this little stuff that you have to go to, and, and you get there, and we go through all the things. We have crawfish ball the school puts on. We, you know, it's a, everything's funny and comical and just kind of trying to prepare you for, for coming. And then you sign out your classes, and, and you fill it all out of what you want to take, and you call mom and dad and say, what am I taking, and, and if you're me because I had no idea where I was going in life. But that's another sermon. So anyway, and go through all these things, come home like, well, that was it. I have went through my process, my routine, and, you know, I'm expecting to turn around in, in August and go right back, and then they, I don't remember if they called or sent a letter, but they're like, you ain't coming here, bud. And uh, I said, and my, my wondering was why, and they said, because your grades are not good enough for us. Go somewhere, get better, and then come back. I had an expectancy. I had an assumption that everything was just normal is what I'm saying. I had an assumption that I was just going to roll right in and, and just go right through the system. Maybe for some, you know, maybe go to college and then you get denied. Maybe for some, some people, have you, have you ever experienced this? I bet there's some of this in the room. Maybe at some part in your life, if you are married, if, if you're not, maybe you've been here at this place where you date someone for years. It's one of those, y'all are one of those weird, long relationship kind of people. And, uh, and you date and just thinking one day you're going to get married only to find out one day they show up and say, see you later. You know, it was, it was an assumption of where life was going. It was an assumption of what was to, what was to come. Everything gets changed. And, or, or possibly even, you know, you got ready to say I do where someone else said spontaneously I don't. You know, preparing for a new job. Sometimes we make assumptions, right? We think it's the right time, and we think it's time for, for a promotion or time they're going to open the door, and then they say, never mind. Perhaps going to the store, and, and maybe it's a random thing. You know, you think it's complete randomness, just going to get your milk at the last minute. And then, lo and behold, you look around, and you leave realizing that your random expectation, you assumed you were just going for milk, ended up being somebody else's divine appointment. You know, those happen too. Discover it wasn't so random after all. You know, some changes are, are random, and, and some are so random that we discover they're really divine. But some that we may assume are divine get changed all of a sudden, and we discover how our assumptions are wrong. I heard a fellow one time, he was all fired up about Jesus, man. He was, he was pumped at that time, and he doesn't, he, he was, I remember the story, we're sitting in the restaurant with some other guys, and he's telling the story, he's been in this revival, he is pumped, been seeing people get saved, he hasn't been saved that long, he, he's just ready to see anybody, you know, his dog and everybody else come to Jesus, and he slows down almost to a stop, but he doesn't stop at the stop sign. And he rolls on through, but there wasn't even really traffic coming, lo and behold, here comes the, the officer. Officer comes up, turns around, he says, man, all right. I didn't think anybody was around. He said, I ain't no way he's going to give me a ticket for that. This is, man, God is setting this appointment up. I'm about to lead this policeman to Jesus. And the only thing that led was a policeman led him to where to sign on the ticket book. You know, sometimes we think we have an assumption, and the assumption is wrong. You know, Jesus confronted the assumptions on so many levels. Do you ever have this happen? You have an assumption but then you're confronted that your assumption is wrong. We'll unravel this a little bit. And depending on how deeply ingrained you are to your assumption of where you think it's going, have you ever found it can almost be offensive to find out I assumed wrong? Ever had that? And, they sh and you can prove it on paper. I assumed I was passing the test and the teacher says I didn't. And I, I just knew it and it's like, oh, she didn't even look at my paper. It's offensive. It can be offensive to be proved wrong. Ironically, though, it seems that there are other people in the world that believe about their assumptions like I believe about my assumptions. Because, see, I, I find that I've run into people 
And they believed that because they assumed, then they naturally assumed that their assumptions were right. You have that problem? I have that problem. I assume that my assumptions are always right. But I run into people that assume something totally different about the situation. They assume they're right. One of us is wrong. I do that. I assume that my assumptions are right. I'll give you an example. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone else and at some point, at some point, this, you think it's going to be a simple conversation, at some point they just go on and on and on and on. And you have checked out like 10 minutes ago. Hopefully that's not the case today. And, and they just won't quit. And you're sitting there, you're looking, you're looking for, please, somebody come screaming through here, distract, that I can get out, you know, let my shoe be untied, and i got to go buy new shoestrings. You know, let me find something that I can grab a hold to and get out of this. And, and you're just, you're hearing them talk and talk, and the whole time you're actually, you're just trying to think of a way out because you just don't care. Y'all have any of those conversations? You know, people have them about us, too. <laughs> Hopefully, though, that's not where we're at now, but you know what happened? They assumed because they liked the subject so much that you and I would too. They assumed because they loved it that we would love it. And that's why they want to tell us about it. But we don't. They assumed wrong. You bore someone. That's okay. You assume maybe you buy a place at a restaurant and that it will be good. And it wasn't, so you lost money. You'll recover But many assumptions are very destructive because in a church, many assume, even in a, in a very physical way, assume that coffee gets made and assume that the building gets cared for and assume outreaches get organized and carried out and assume that a nursery is, is always perfect and assume that messages are given with the same always just ease as it is for many people just to come and sit in a chair. And the assumptions are wrong. With the same effort that it took possibly just an attender to get up and get dressed that morning. To drive here and to, and to so effortlessly happen just to drop a little money into the offering box. To cover the expenses. Assuming that it will replace me not being involved physically. And the assumption is wrong. And even beyond that, the assumption is very destructive to seeing people, other people give their lives to Jesus. We assume a lot of things. Have you ever assumed you knew some, what someone was thinking? I know I'm dragging this out, but I, got, I, 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 I see some that I'm about to give up on. I see some that I, I believe there's a connection point. Have you, ever, have you ever assumed that you knew what somebody was thinking? I have many times. I, 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 find, I have responded to Callie in a way in such a conversation that she turns and says, I didn't mean anything by it. I was just asking or telling you about it. But I assumed, I picked up a tone that I assumed was pointed. I assumed was directed. I assumed was even maybe a little offending. And my assumption was wrong. I, but I, I heard what it is. I heard what I thought was a tone of a voice that she meant to be upsetting or to boss in me. So my pride kicked in. Because that's what happens. And then my pride kicked in. And I'm assuming that she's talking at me and not to me. And I can tell you my assumptions have many time, more times than they have been right. They have been wrong. Can you relate? Have you ever been angry with somebody because of what you knew they were thinking? <laughs> this church, y'all. I was a little flustered some, yesterday with somebody that that because of what they were thinking. I never even got near them. I just saw their vehicle. I knew what they were thinking. <laughs> For real. When the ice cream man shows up at your fundraiser, I assumed he was there to make off big. <laughs> I had to step back and say, God, you can do anything with this you want to. Who am I to get greedy all of a sudden? Hurt for the workers, but you know. Yeah, he gave us 20 bucks. Made 500 bucks. No, I'm just kidding. All right. And you hear what, you know, we make assumptions on sometimes without ever hearing a word. 
Or maybe we hear one sentence. You ever do this? You know, and this is kind of getting offensive right here. But we hear one sentence of a paragraph that is spoken, and we develop a case against them because we assume what they really mean. This is News Media 101 right here. This is, you know, let's take a snapshot, especially of a preacher or a politician. And some people put them in the same category, but I'm going to separate. And, you know, they're going to take, take one sentence out of something that maybe is so good and going to blast everywhere. And the whole society, everybody that, that believes what they keep being proved wrong on for some reason, everybody that believes it is going to make a, a big assumption of that person's even heart. All we heard is a statement. Drives me crazy. Sometimes I hear this about churches. Somebody talking, they go, oh, that church is just about such and such. I'm like, do you know them? Because sometimes I get to get close to the one that's getting talked about, and I'm like, I know a whole different heart than you know. Yeah, but somebody told me. Well, good. Assumptions, assumptions is where I'm going. In the church world, we can assume that we know every detail of a crooked heart based on one statement, can't we? People divorce over assumptions. They, we assume no hope. We assume the spouse will never change. We assume it's them and not me that needs to change. Murders happen over assumptions. And even after all the bad assumptions that are made every day, and we're going to leave this behind, it is common to hear someone say, I'm a pretty good judge of people. And I know who's real and who isn't. And by doing so, what they just did was they assumed the responsibility that was never theirs to begin with. I believe God set that one straight. Assumptions. A uh, man I like to listen to named Stephen Furtick described assumptions like this. Assumption is the vulnerability of ignorance masked by the illusion of certainty. I'm going to say it again. It takes a minute to sink in, but if you think on it for three days, it's real powerful. The vulnerability, assumption is the vulnerability of the ignorance masked, hidden by, covered up with the illusion of certainty. The vulnerable willingness to expose our ignorance that we attempt to hide by covering it by stating how certain we are. Simply put, when we state our assumption, often we reveal to others our ignorance where we all see certainty. Assumptions, they're natural though. Assumptions themselves, they're not always bad. God, I mean, God made a mind. He made us to examine the process. You assumed you sat in your chair. Nobody felt with it. Nobody touched it. You assumed you were going to wake up this morning, set your alarm clock. You assumed you were going to make it to here, possibly laid out your clothes. You, you assume where we're going to be tomorrow. Not all assumptions are bad. Assumptions are a part of it. But where the tragedy lies is where we are more devoted to our assumptions than we are to listening to what may actually prove our assumptions wrong. I'll say it again. The tragedy lies when, there are, when we are more devoted to our assumptions than we are to listening to what may actually prove our assumptions wrong or simply clarify our assumptions. Many times the very thing that keeps a person from the will of God, from the will of God in Christ Jesus, is simply as simple as an assumption. Consider how ridiculous it will be to look back on life or to stand on the judgment day and be confronted with how we miss God's plan because of one dumb assumption. And yet Jesus confronted the assumptions of that day. He, he clarified the truth, and because their pride wouldn't admit that they were wrong, they crucified him. Assumptions. Today we need to come to terms. Are we more willing, and we'll wrap this up, are we more willing to conform to the ways, of our, if our, to his ways, if our, when our assumptions are revealed as false? Because if not, we will indeed crucify Jesus again if we are not willing to admit that our assumptions are wrong when we're confronted with his truth. And some of you are wondering when we're going to get in Scripture, and we're almost there. Matthew 5. Remember, this is Jesus' first big speech. Big thing. People from all over come out, and all the sea towns, we're going to talk about them in a minute. All, all the people from around the shores, they come, they come down to hear the big thing. And Jesus looks around, and he sees a crowd, and he says, opportunity has arose. And it says he begins to teach so many things. Matthew chapter 5. Let's just jump down to verse 21, 22. Let's kind of cut through the fluff because, I mean, he starts off, you know, real nice. Remember, we've looked at this before a couple weeks ago. He comforts the morning, you know, bless those who mourn for they will be comforted. And, and blessed are you when people mock you and say all kinds of evil things against you for, you know, the kingdom of God is theirs. And, and you are the salt of the earth. And, and you're here to make the place better, basically. You know, you're the influence that I want to use. And then he begins shifting. And in verse 21 and 22, he says this. 
And you have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. And if you commit murder, you are subject to the judgment. And you're right. But I say, even if you're angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. And if you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. Man, we, would all be, we wouldn't be here. It would be a prison church. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fire of, of hell. Curse. Basically, to call someone saying, you, you godless fool. <laughs> you worthless is another way to say it. You're a worthless being. And yet these are things that are said every day. And this is a weight that people feel every day. Worthless. Because someone said so. And Jesus goes so far to say, just the saying puts you in condemnable to hell. You know, if you curse someone, call someone worthless, good for nothing, someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. But the law said, just don't kill. I mean, that's easy. The religious teaching said, mom and dad always told us, just don't kill anybody, son. You'll be all right. And so we never did. But now, so because that was just wrong. And then we roll on to verse 27 and 30, through 30 here. Just for time's sake. It says, you have heard the commandment that says, you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to stumble, or, or causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin... Cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. That's rough. So what's, what's happening? They're sitting there, wait a minute. Even though I didn't physically do anything wrong, if I just look, you want me to gouge my eyes out now? You want me to cut off my hand for simple things as this? These, I mean, can you put yourself, this has to be confusing words. When Jesus was born, the first announcement we have recorded in the scripture is the angels showed up to the shepherds, remember? Good news. Glad tidings, I bring you good news. For born among you is the son of David, the Savior, the Messiah is born today. You're a favorite. Does anyone remember the birth, I mean, the birth now? Jesus is just, you know, in, in baby terms, he is normal. He's accepted. Babies are accepted pretty easily, aren't they? From the best to the worst, from the good to the bad, to the deformities, to the irregularities. Whatever, babies are always accepted. Hey, let's celebrate his birth. Good news. Mary had her baby. All right, we've been waiting a while. The Messiah's here. But no matter what, babies grow up, don't they? And good news, he was born, but now he has grown. And he says we're all going to hell. Because just because I, I, I mean, because I haven't killed anybody, but now I can't even get mad. I managed to keep my body pure. Like Mama always said, she was proud of me for the life I lived and, you know, staying away from shady ladies. But now you're telling me that I can't even just look and think about it? This is, it's still a hard truth to swallow today, isn't it? If we get honest. We get it's hard on two accounts. They're like, Jesus really don't want us cut, gouging out our eyes. I don't believe he said stuff he didn't mean. I mean you know, you, you take what you want on that, but when a man rises from the dead, I'm going to believe he meant everything he said. He don't really want us cutting off our arms. I, I think he does. I'm not going to participate in it or advocate it or have an altar call for it. What you do is your own is your own business, but don't ever, don't associate until anybody at Cornerstone Church told you to cut stuff off. It's just, But yet, this has to be confusing words. It ha has to be a bit strange to them to say, I managed to keep, keep everything looking good. It's still hard to swallow that. You mean I can be a good person and I'll still go to hell? Look with me at this. I mean, still hard truth. I mean, it is to me. I I'll just throw this out there because sometimes... I have a good reason to be mad. I'm mad at the ice cream man. I got a good reason to be mad. It's 
spent a year and a half of my life trying to get my children home and people come out here and they hard and they sweat it. They even go to weddings and then clean up and come back and, and late at night. And I got all, all these people out here just pouring out and doing all these good deeds. And, and you're spitting in their face too. And, and that just makes me mad too because I can handle me. But now you, you're messing with them. And, and sometimes we got a good reason to get mad. I actually like the guy. He's a friend of mine. But, or was. Now he is. But, uh, you know, we got a good reason to get mad sometimes. Sometimes the preacher's offensive. Sometimes the friend's offensive. Sometimes mom and dad is offensive. Sometimes the teacher's offensive. Got a good reason to get mad. Sometimes they meant to hurt you. Sometimes they, they do like I did with a guy who's a friend of mine, and some other friends taught me into getting him outside just so they could beat him up. He had a good reason to get mad at me. And then I got mad at them for telling me to do that, and I did it. That was wrong. Managed to keep everything in check. My teenage years, I'll be honest, my teenage years caused me some serious battles to fight as I began to follow Jesus in my late teenage years. Because after looking for a while, it became very difficult to stop looking. And if you would have ever asked me before August 25th, 1997, if I was a Christian, if I was saved, if I knew where I was going, I was just, yes, saved, sanctified on my way, I'm ready. I remember saying a prayer. I had this whole routine down. I mean, I knew it, even though it was actually a dream. But I, I, I had this whole thing of why I was going to heaven, why I was saved. Because I assumed, can you say this with me? I assumed, I, when I look back at it, and I want to get real honest, I just assumed I was good enough. You ever get there? Good enough. Do you, do you ever think like this? You know, I mean, we all know that we aren't all that good. I mean, if, if, let's just, you know, hypothetically, if we just had a camera in all your minds, we could actually see these things, and we could throw them on the screen up here for everybody to see. Of Just all the thoughts that have raced through, and we would just pick the highlights, you know, because we just want the stuff that everybody laughs about and you feel bad about. And we'd put it on the screen, and er everybody would be looking and going, oh, and you sitting there and just blushing and crawling, and all of a sudden you got dinner to run to and got things to happen. And, you know, forget this week. What about maybe even today? And we threw it all up here. You know, we all, we all got some, some junk in the closet, don't we? Some things that people would be offended by, that we might be ashamed about, that we might be embarrassed about. I mean, come on. We all know that we aren't all that good if we're honest, right? I mean, we can be good out here, but we, what's going on in here is our secret and our business and is ugly oftentimes. But we sure can be good enough, can't we? We know we're not good, but we can be good enough. Good enough, it means as long as my outside looks good, even when my inside looks nasty, it's what's on the outside that, look, that makes it. Now, we're good enough. Even when, my, even when my inside is so putrid, even when my inside, I had these thoughts, even when my inside, in, inside I'm wanting to harbor, harbor bitterness, even on my inside, thinking about things that shouldn't be thought about. But as long as I keep my outside, where everybody likes to be around me and likes to think it's good and will even pat me on the back every now and then, well, that's good enough, right? Good enough, good enough. And what happens is, here's the painful truth. If all I do, let me back up. Here's my question. Is it possible that I may be making life decisions based on what I assume of God? Assume of Jesus, assume the Holy Spirit. Is it possible in that context that I'm making life decisions about good enough based on what I assume that Jesus says is good enough. Do we find ourselves there not only assuming what others think or mean, but if we get honest, do we possibly even sometimes live our lives based on what we assume that Jesus means? Here's a painful truth. If all I do is listen to others, if all I do is listen to preaching, if all I do is listen to testimonies, if all I do is listen to Bible studies, if all I do is listen to someone else's stories, then all I have to base my eternity on is the assumption that is based on whether I did or did not like what the other person said. If all I do is listen to preaching and listen to other, and, and I just take what other people give me, but I never check it out on my own, I never have a relationship on my own, then I, my whole eternity is based on whether I did or did not like what you said. And people pick, we pick churches out of this, we pick friends because of this, we pick everything out of this, and sadly we kind of made our own Savior out of this based on what we do and do not like. 
So what happens then, then I have to go and base my attorney on an assumption based on whether someone did what they did or did not say. So I reveal my ignorance when I speak and I declare so confidently what I'm certain about. But really, I just assumed it because somebody else said it. Assumptions. Assumption number one. I was wanting to do it today. It's a two-part, two assumptions. Had two of them real good. But I feel like God just wants me to hang out on this. And I, I know I'm belaboring it, but I, I argued enough with God this morning to just say, okay, I'll just do what I believe you want me to do. And I'm very uncomfortable with this, to be honest. Assumption number one. I'm a good enough person. I will try, well, you know, I, I think if I help enough people, I'd be good enough. I had a man tell me one time he was going to heaven because he, he volunteered at the stew pot once a year. We do that, though, don't we? We make fun of him, but what are our assumptions? Look with me, if you will, in Luke 10, Luke 10, 13 through 15, real quickly. Good, good, good people. Good people. I'm sorry, I gotta help. I'm trusting you on this one, Chelsea. Did I not give you that scripture? Oh, we froze up. Uh-oh, got to go to hard copy. I just didn't have my pages matched up, so Luke 10. Some of you would... Remember this? It's a very confusing passage. If you get it up, just like toot your horn or something. 10, 13, it says, What sorrow, Jesus is saying this, What sorrow awaits you, and I may mispronounce this, Chorazan and Bethsaida? For if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, their people would have repented of their sins long ago, clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. Yes, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day than you are. And you, and you people of Capernaum, will you be honored in heaven? No. You'll go to the place of the dead. And then he looked at his disciples and said, anyone who accepts your message is also accepting me. And anyone who rejects you is rejecting me. And anyone who rejects me is rejecting God who sent me. He rolls, he rolls it out like this. This is Jesus speaking. He's speaking, here's the, the irony of it. He is speaking to towns that saw a lot of miracles. He's t speaking to towns that heard him preach a lot. He's preaching to people, you know, you always see where he's going from this place to that place, crossing the sea. Remember, Peter's walking on, uh, Peter's out there, he's walking on the sea. Jesus crossing the Sea of Galilee, going to another place. He gets over there and everybody chases him around the other side and they come out and he heals their sick and and cast out demons. Everywhere he goes so often, he's back and forth and back and forth. And he's talking, the names of these towns, are, they're border towns, they're sea towns. They're actually some of the very people, these two first towns are named that, as part of the ones who came out on the Sermon on the Mount. They came out to hear him. They come flocking down the shores to come out to hear him, to give him a reason to even begin to teach them. And Jesus' announcement at birth was this. He brought good news. He brought great joy. He is the Messiah. But today... When we carry assumptions, we, a lot of times the lifestyle of an assumption is this. We talk about how good, and we talk about the blesser, and we talk about easier, and we talk about better. And they are true. But with that, we see that Jesus also brought the greater, the blesser, the better. And we'll unravel this, and we'll shut her down. But Jesus also brought a greater judgment. You know, think of the New Testament. The New Testament, that's where Jesus made everything easy. Now we, I mean, think about this. Don't kill. Now you can't even be mad secretly. Don't, don't, don't get out there and mess with, with them ladies. Don't even think about it. Or you're going to hell now. I mean, now, now you can't even think about it. Now what has always been good enough is not even near enough. I don't know about you. I'm not real good at controlling my thoughts, are you? I mean, can you just see a thought coming, and before it gets there, it's like, she, no, nah, I ain't thinking about that. I'm sorry, oh, she looks good, and then it's like, oh, I don't need to think about that. It's already there. You know, it's, 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 it's seeing and going, man, I can't believe, no, I ain't going to think about that. No, I can't believe that he showed up and doing what he's doing and acting like they're acting in the middle of how good everybody's been to them, and they're going to talk like that. I ain't mad, though. I just can't believe they act like that. All in our mind. Not here. Just in here. Which becomes here. And now, 
I don't know about you, but those thoughts coming to me where it says cast down imagination, the imagination comes before I cast it down. I'm not, I haven't achieved the level where I cast it down before it comes. And so then they're judged by their thoughts. Now you can't even privately hold these thoughts. Now good enough physically, now good enough doesn't have to do with what's out here, but good enough, Jesus transferred everything and says forget about everything going on the outside of you that everybody can't see. I'm looking at what's going on the inside. That only I can see. Have you ever considered that Jesus didn't make it easier? He actually made it more difficult. He, 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 he took the bar, and what he did is he took everything up a notch. He raised it up. Consider this, and we'll, we'll move on. Let's, look at, let's, let's just look at this. Mark, Mark chapter 7, verse 19 through 23. There's a lot of scriptures this morning. This is like Bible study. Mark chapter 7, Mark chapter 7. There we go. I gave you that one. Praise God. I did something right. F food doesn't go into your heart. Jesus is talking again. But it only passes through your stomach. And then it goes into the sewer. And they're like, well, yeah. Let's roll on. I don't want to read the little part. And then, then he added, it is what comes from the inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart. Wait, you mean it's not that it comes into my heart, but it comes out of my heart. Comes evil thoughts, comes sexual immorality, comes theft. I didn't take nothing. Yes, you did. Comes murder, comes adultery, comes greed, comes wickedness, comes deceit, comes lustful desire. I don't desire, I want to be rid of it. Yes, you do. Envy and slander and pride and foolishness. I thought fools go to hell, is what it said earlier. And all these vile things come from within, and they are what defile you. Now, now, they don't drink, they eat the right things, they do the right things, and they assume it's enough because all they got to do is stay away from the split toe hoof and, you know, wear clothes. That it, none of that little, you know, polyester cotton is straight cotton or whatever it's going to be. You know, maybe some silk or something. It's all pure. They ain't got no labradoodles. They're doing everything perfect. Everything's a perfect breed. I mean, this is all law. They're bringing, doing the order according to the sacrifices to cover for their sins that they even did do wrong on. Everything's going well. This, and, but Jesus comes along, and he's, all of a sudden he said, and they assume, hey, this is good enough. It's what we taught. It's what my mom said. My dad said. It's what's been passed down. This is what the prophets say and the commandments say. Yet Jesus states, he says, you can make everything right, but if you're unclean on the outside, you're still defiled. And if this was the Old Testament, when he speaks this, when he says you're defiled, what he did is he just brought everything in the old into the new. Because if you, you can go through and do your little Bible time this time in Exodus and Leviticus and roll on even a little bit in Numbers. And when you read through that, if you're on the reading plan this year, if you've been following along with us, you've, you've been through this recently. And it says, you know, and those who are defiled, put them outside the camp. And if anyone has had even emissions from their body during the night when they are asleep, they are defiled. That's what the Bible says. Genesis, what am I reading in now? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, number two. Deuteronomy says that. I had to think where I was. Deuteronomy, even if, they, even if you just like, man, you don't, you don't even have control of what's going on with your body and things are leaking out, then you're defiled. Get them. They are not allowed in the presence of the Lord. That's what it was. They took defiled. And all of a sudden they're like, ha, oh, we know what defiled is. That means we're not even welcome into your presence at all. As a matter of fact, we're kicked out of your presence. Dare that if we come into your presence, we die. You, God, will kill us for assaulting you like that. If this was the Old Testament, it would be called unclean, which means get away. And yet Jesus declares that while you may be good enough on the outside, maybe nothing's leaking out, maybe everything's going okay, because of what's inside of you, you are not welcome. Because of what's inside of you, you're kicked out. Now you, now you see Jesus, is, man, why Jesus is so loved so much for his birth. Remember, we love Christmas. We love Easter. He's loved for his birth. He's loved for his death. And so many people are on board for those two right there. Even people that don't believe that Jesus is a Savior, he is a good person because of how he was born and because of how he died. But have you ever noticed that the beginning and the ending are loved of Jesus? But if we pay attention to Jesus in between those two, Man, he could turn some people off real fast. Jesus lost a lot of friends in his middle. Even his closest ran. They disassociated. Even Peter, he says, Peter, man, after I come back, this is what you're going to do. But in his darkest moment, Peter said, I don't know that guy. I've ate, and I've slept, and I've walked around, and I've traveled, and I've, seen, I've even done miracles and seen miracles, and I've seen the dead race with this guy for three and a half years, but I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know him. I don't want nothing to do with him. 
His middle, the beginning and the end are great. This is, this is like getting a steak and you just kind of cut one side and a little bit off the other side and you throw away the middle. You know, on both sides are the fat, which I happen to like, but I mean, you don't want to throw away the meat. It's like going to your wedding and saying, I do. And then you just leave and you come back at your spouse's funeral to pay your respects. You just leave the middle completely out. Forget about it. Is this how, let me ask, uh, have we evolved into this assumption of this is what a life with Jesus is about? We celebrate his birth and we celebrate his death. Praise God for the victory. And we're going to get into that but, and praise God for all that. But do we, can we become so blind and so jaded and so built up in our assumptions of what Jesus desires of us that we can completely stay out of everything that involved the middle of his life? That yet the rest of the, the apostles spent the rest after the four gospels telling us and reminding people about because even they wanted to forget the middle, but they liked the beginning and the end. Who in here wants to be married to someone who just says, I do, and then doesn't show up until after you're dead? To say, good job. Nobody in here would stay with that. Nobody in here that's not married says, one day, I'm going to meet the man of my dreams, and I got my wedding all planned out, I got my dress, I got everything, I've already got it ordered, I've got the ring that he's going to give me, because I love it. And I'm going to say, I do, and that's the last time I'm going to see him. Unless I go to his funeral and see him dead, otherwise he'll just come see me dead. Is this how we are with Jesus? Like, hello, and plan on hello again after it's all done. Well, hello, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. It is so good to meet you. I'm, uh, here I am today, and I will catch you in the afterlife. Thank you for saving me. Because for the rest of my life, I'm still going to be whoever I want to be. And then we, and we go around and say, that's good enough. Because we assume Jesus is different than marriage, yet he, made, he created marriage to be a reflection of the, his relationship with us. If the birth and the death are the only important parts of Jesus' life, then why did he even have it in between? He's Jesus. He's God. He could have showed up and said, I'm here. Y'all celebrate. Kill me. I'm gone. And it would have been enough. But here's what the middle displayed. Here's what Jesus taught to a good people. Here's what Jesus taught to a very religious people. He says, you're good, but I say you're unacceptable and you're unclean at your heart. And there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. Nothing. There is absolutely nothing. He says, he wrote even in the Old Testament, every heart is wicked. Who can trust it? Don't follow your heart. That thing will get you messed up. It says even the, the intentions of our look at man. And with Noah, he said, he wanted to kill him. It says, because even the intentions of their heart, everything is wicked. And they can't do anything about it at all. Absolutely no hope. The people are sitting there listening. And, and if they had any sense, they're going, we're doomed. We can't help it. You created us. We didn't create it. We didn't have to be here. You put us here. And we had nothing to go on unless, unless we have a Savior. You ever thought about? Sometimes people say life is so hard. Or say, I don't know how much I can take. Or, and, I, and I empathize with that. Or, or, or just, I don't know how much more I can have you ever considered that this life was never be intended that we would ever survive it without a Savior? This life was never even intended to be enjoyed without a Savior? For there is no lasting enjoyment without the relationship of a Savior? Like there is no enjoyable marriage without the other spouse constantly around being enjoyable? The birth sounded good. The cross? Ah, that's relieving. It says he took the weight of the world, the government, Isaiah says, and he would take the government and rest upon his shoulders. Remember he said, take my yoke upon you because my burden is easy. What if we saw that in reality, even the cross did not relieve? The cross actually brings a greater condemnation. Think about this. You have a, most of you have a car in here. Are you ridden in one at some point in your life? Do any of you ride in cars with seat belts? Whether you wear them or not, you got them. 
Whether you like them or not, you got You know what? There were people one time that could buy a car without a seatbelt. And you know what happened with the introduction of the seatbelt? A greater penalty. Because now you can pay for not wearing that seatbelt. Out of your pocketbook. You become, all of a sudden, with a seatbelt came in where, where it was introduced as a protection and a guard and a lifesaver, but yet the failure to use it can cost the wallet book and it can even cost our very life a lot of times. It's, the seatbelt was introduced in order to, to rescue, but even not using it, what the, when the officer pulls over and he says, you have something to protect you, and you won't use it. You're a fool, and here's your ticket for paying $25 for being an idiot that assumes you're going to get above the law, and you're not. 25 bucks. 25 bucks. You keep adding it up, it hurts. At one time, it hurts sometimes, my house. But anyway, it's another story. You get a ticket for not using what was given for your rescue. The people had always been accountable to having good actions. That was nothing new. They had been accountable to living right, to looking right, to acting right, to treating right. They had been accountable to all this. But with Jesus, now they're accountable to, we're accountable to our sins. And we're even accountable to our thoughts. And we're even accountable to the secret things that are hidden in our heart. With Jesus on, comes the cross, which uh, it could be seen as a, so many people see as a relief. But the failure, failure to see it accurately, it actually brings a greater judgment. Because on the day comes and God will say, I gave you my son, and you chose no. If you do not have him, maybe I would say you should offer a little more sacrifice you could have taken care of. But I gave you my son, and you still rejected, and you chose your way. I cannot let that go. Depart from me. For this reason, I never knew you. But here's the cool part. Romans 5, let's go to Romans 5, 20, real quick. Two, two verses, and that's it. Wherever Callie is, run around here. Romans 5. Keep it alive. Is the computer about to die? I give up. I normally write these scriptures in my notebook, but for the sake of tournaments that kept us up late and prevented my mornings, I didn't. Romans, Romans, Romans. If you got a Bible, you're there ahead of me. So you're, you've got brownie points. Romans 5.20 and then Romans 2.4. Romans 5.20 says this. Many of you recognize it. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. Ever realize that maybe Jesus wasn't being mean. He was just trying to bring out the truth in order to help. If, if you're failing, if you're in a class and your teacher says that's wrong, they're trying to keep you from failing. Not just trying to say, you idiot. Simple they were. But as people sinned more and more, kept saying, the teacher, you're wrong, you're wrong. God's wonderful grace became all the more abundant. So you're telling me this. With a greater judge, God in his love, and this is where it gets big. God in his greatness. God in, we talk about his love that never fails. God's love is so big that even when he raises the bar, it says my judgment is coming so much higher. I'm going to give grace to so much higher than that. Romans 2, 4. And this is what we shut down. Come on, dear. It says, don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing? Can't you see that his kindness it's not intended to wipe, to, to just say, sweep your sin on the road, but it's intended to turn us from our sin. In God's kindness, the cross, the, good, the great relief right there on the cross, it was never meant to say the middle does not matter. It was meant to say my great kindness towards you is a means to turn you back towards my middle and follow me. Follow the way I led you for the greater life, the greater protection. Is it possible that the war wages in, within us, the battle we lose sometimes, is simply just a bad assumption? Assuming, and not, if, if you catch this one phrase, you're going to judge me. If you hang with me, you're going to like me. 
Is it possible that we assume that Jesus died simply to cover our sin? I'll get a little more blunt with it. Is it possible that we assume we live a life based on that Jesus died to cover our sin? But what the scripture really reveals that he died to turn us from our sins so that in him we can be covered. Isn't that right? His blood covers me. It's, he's the one that takes all my sins and throws them as far as the east is to the west. He's the one that says, you are forgiven, I remember no more. Is it possible that, some, that we can get caught up in living a life of saying Jesus covered my sins when in reality he died, he gave his life on a cruel cross in order to say, I gave my life on a cross that you could turn from your sins because the cross did not cover your sins. Me on the cross covers your sin. And when you turn from, the, from, from your sin and turn from me, in me all your sins are washed away. Isn't that right? If I'm getting a little off, I, I stand to be correct because it's a little uneasy to me to, because it's always been said so clearly the other way, but Christ is where the redemption is. He is the spotless lamb who took away the sins of the world, right? Therefore, he laid down his life. The cross in his kindness, the cross says, there is no way you could possibly live up to what I demand of you. Therefore, he lays down his life on a cross that we may see the extreme kindness and in turn, give our lives with a heart that is declaring, saying, God, I don't understand why you did it. Jesus, I don't understand why you went through with it. But because you did, I turn from everything that I've known to give all of me to you. My life in your hands. I'm not hanging on what somebody said. I'm not hanging on what I assume. Eternity is way too risky to just assume because I can't wrap my mind and I, when I take your words and say how wicked I am and then I look inside and I say you're right but I always thought I was okay and because I see your kindness anyway and because I see your love anyway because I see you lived out of your full life as you planned to fulfill your plan to cover my sins because I can't understand it I will wrap my heart around you I will turn from who I have been to become conformed into your image as Romans 8 29 declared I, will, I want to seek your image and your ways it says you have predestined me to be like you and because I can't understand why you would even set that in motion why you would plan that and especially the way that I have lived opposite of it I will turn my life around because I see your kindness is so attractive that I will never understand it but I will never I will never give up on chasing after to discover y'all New Testament says it's covered. The New Testament gives a greater grace, a greater judgment if we don't choose His covering. But His covering became much more merciful as a result of Him raising the judgment. Man, our God is good. Hey, God, He, hey God, he, he knows how to just come right into all our assumptions, how to hook them, throw them out the window and say, look, you're stupid on your own. Come to me. I took care of it. Even when I knew you, some of you wouldn't even get it, I loved you. I created you. Come to me. Come to me, come to me. That is a good God. That is a good Savior that can be on a cross and says, Father, forgive them. Because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know that their actions look good enough. But their heart is far from them. But in his kindness, he says, because the judgment is raised, my kindness is more extreme. A turn. Today I want to ask, have you lived? Have you lived in the place? I know this has been different. I know this is completely out of the ordinary. I know this is long, but I, I just got to ask. It's got to be for a reason. Have you been saying I'm good enough? And if you've been saying you're good enough, are you willing to hang on to good enough to see if your assumption is right? Are you willing just to say, Jesus, I trust you. 
I admit, my pride is pushed aside. You are right. I was wrong. I'll chase you, Jesus. I'll turn to you, Jesus. I give my life to you, Jesus. I can never understand it, but I'll never quit trying to figure it out. Jesus, you love me anyway. Today with heads bowed and eyes closed, that's you. Man, you've been good enough, good enough. Keep saying, I don't understand why these things are happening to me. I've been good enough. God should be treating me better. I don't understand why I go through. I've been good enough. I don't understand why I've been given the light, treated like I have been, because I'm a good person. I'm good enough. I want to ask you today, are you really good enough when God moves out all the good deeds you do and just moves straight into the heart with which he sees and which he judges? In that facet, are we really, are you really good enough? Because if that's the what we're hanging on to, I want to invite you today to say, you know what? I am not good enough. But I'm going to chase a great Savior. I am not good enough. But I will choose Him. I am not good enough. But because His kindness went over, went over my wickedness, I will turn from who I am to become who He is. And I will repent of my sins and say, Father, I need you. If that's you today, I just want to invite you right where you are. I want to invite you to pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I give my life to you. Everything I am from this day forward, I will build my life around you and your promises and your grace and your goodness. And yes, for what your finished work on the cross and because you rose again out of another extreme example of your kindness. Jesus, I'll never tell you I'm good enough again because I'm seeking you, the perfect one, my Father, my Lord, my Savior, and yours. I seek you, Jesus. I seek you, Jesus. Yours, Jesus. Today as we stand, if you pray that prayer, we want to celebrate with you. We want to rejoice. We want to shout. We want to see God have his way in your life. And you become start be just making that chapter one, that first step into the plans and the promises of God, the plans that he had written, and you just begin the, the first phase of this journey with him. Because with Jesus, it's not as good as it gets at the beginning. It's just the beginning of how good it's going to continue to get. That's Jesus. That he can even take you to a place that you can say, in the midst of enduring shame, I find joy in the Father of what I see in him. Even though I don't see good around me, I see the good in him. And I can find joy. He wants to carry you to that chapter 2 and that chapter 3 and that chapter 4 to that eternity with him in that manner. Today I want to invite you to come. Come as man saying, come. Come to the altar. Come and say, Jesus, I'm yours. Jesus, I give my life to you. As a church, we will celebrate. We will shout. We're about to have somebody get baptized. We're going to watch a testimony. It's going to be good. We want to rejoice with you right now. Celebration before the celebration. Miss Isaac Reed and I would like to tell you what my how my brother Todd said tonight that um that he got saved he got baptized four or five times because he never really got saved and he was talking about and then like the fifth or fourth time he was ready to accept God's love. And the first time I didn't mean it, but and um, a couple of nights later, um, my dad took me to a play called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. And I saw how people, thousands of people wanted to know God's love and how they put so much thought into the play and how much how much they wanted it to, to save people 
And that night, the pastor said, if you're ready to be put in the book of life, which means the book, that, the book of life, there's a list of people that can go to heaven. And uh, he said, why don't you come forward and give your life to Jesus? And he, and I was one of those people, and thousands of people came to see Jesus that night, including me, because I'm, because I've given a life to the Lord Jesus Christ today, I'm going to be baptized.